Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session, Rebalancing Society, Humanitarians Finding Their Place. My name is Simon Western. I'm the Chief Executive of the Eco Leadership Institute, and we're partnering with the HLA to try and reimagine leadership in a sector. Today, I am honoured to introduce Henry Mintzberg, Cleghorn Professor of Management at McGill University and author of 21 books. Henry is a world-renowned and iconic management expert who has redefined the field of management. He is a famously outspoken reformer. Henry says of the MBA, it trains the wrong people in a wrong way with the wrong consequences. When challenged to do something about this, Henry co-founded the IMPM, a countercultural management education programme focusing on how leaders learn from practice and how they learn from each other. I first met Henry when working with him on this programme and we brought public, private and not-for-profit managers together and sent them on management exchanges where they'd visit each other and learn from each other. On this programme I visited Sudan and Kosovo with humanitarian leaders and it was my first experience of working in the sector and I'm very grateful to Henry for that. Henry critiques corporate society and advocates a rebalancing. He writes, Enough of the imbalance that is destroying our democracy, our planet, ourselves. We require a radical renewal unprecedented in human history. So a warm welcome to Henry Mintzberg. <laughs> Henry, very good to see you. How are you today? No, I'm fine, Simon. It's a bit cold here in Montreal, but otherwise, minus 20 last night. But uh, <laughs> indoors is perfectly fine. Now, we only freeze, Canadians freeze in England because they don't, they didn't use to heat the houses warmly enough. In Canada, we're cozy indoors. That's good. So, really good to have you. We're very um, thankful for you for, uh, for giving us some of your time. So we're here to talk about rebalancing society, something you've been thinking about for a long time and writing about. Can you say a bit more to us about what rebalancing society is, Henry? Yeah, you know, those words you read, I guess, are in the book that was written in 2015. And look what's happened since 2015. Uh, it's, it's just been not just downhill, it's almost been a drastic descent. <clears throat> if we keep going at this rate, God knows what will happen. Uh, Simon, I visited uh, Prague in, in 1991, two years after the Velvet Revolution, and people were going on about uh, how capitalism had triumphed, and uh, <clears throat> I, I thought that was dead wrong. I, capitalism didn't triumph. Communism collapsed under its own dead weight. It was out of balance. The public sector was completely dominant in the Eastern European countries. Um, and the private sector was marginalized by government and what I call the plural, what I've since called, but discussed it then, but not under this name, <clears throat> what I since called the plural sector uh, or civil society or community society or call it what you like, uh, was also marginalized and continues to be marginalized. You know, the Chinese uh, communist government can't handle any civil society uh, or community associations as a threat. Um, and so it seemed to me a healthy society balanced public, private, and plural, or business, uh, government, business, and community. Um, and because of this belief that capitalism has triumphed, had triumphed in 89, capitalism has been triumphing ever since. And it's dominating the world. So we have three superpowers now, one out of balance in favor of government in China, one out of balance in favor of uh, uh, markets in, and business in the U.S., and one out of balance in favor of the plural sector in Russia with, uh, with a nationalist group dominating. In other countries like Iran, it's religion that dominates, but it's still plural sector. So, you know, Post-war, the United States had high tax rates and uh, and very generous uh, benefits for people. It was balanced. Uh, it's been imbalanced ever since. Can you say a bit more about the plural 
society, because the broader sector, because the, uh, I think people think of charities or not-for-profit, but you have a broader understanding of it, don't you? Well, it's huge. Um, it's huge, and we don't uh, recognize it, ironically. You know, de Tocqueville, when he wrote two volumes called Democracy in America, he was a Frenchman who visited America in the 1820s, and uh, he saw community, what he called associations, as key to that new democracy. Um, but now we talk public and private and left and right, and look what's going on in the UK right now, for that matter. Uh, always the same case. There's no moderate center left in the UK. There is in Canada. Um, but but we we go to extremes and we ignore the fact that like a stool that needs three legs for balance, not two, we ignore the fact that the plural sector community groups are key to balance. Um, and and, and uh, there's probably nobody in the audience who hasn't interacted with, with the five or six of them in the last few days, including your own association, which is plural sector. It's not owned by investors. It's not owned by government. It's, it's a not-for-profit uh, uh, association. Um, and, you know, many of, our, many, uh, of, of the greatest uh, hospitals in the United States, for example, are plural sector, whether it's the Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins or whatever. Um, ironically, Canada has a very socialized uh, medical system, more so than the UK. Um, and yet our hospitals, too, are plural sector, their community. Governments ignore that. Uh, so, so it's a huge, huge sector. It's all Greenpeace and all kinds of trusts and, and unions and cooperatives. And it's huge. Uh, and yet we don't recognize it as a key part of our society. And that's part of the imbalance. And what's your thoughts on how we can bring back balance? How do we, how do, we do that? Is it, is it building more of the plural, plural sector? I don't think we need more of the plural sector. I think we need more focus in the plural sector. We need to recognize its role. <clears throat> my role in that, my answer to your question is I write books like, uh, like this, you know, uh, and I publish websites by the same name, rebalancingsociety.org, which really contains uh, everything I've thought about and, and summaries of other people work uh, uh, on getting back to balance. Um, the first step is to recognize, uh, uh, recognize the sector. Um, you know, I can quote, uh, reading some of your material, your own material earlier, this morning, we created a declaration of interdependence uh, some years ago. It's on that website, rebalancingsociety.org. And one of the sentences in that website is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created dependent on each other, our Earth, and its climate. Um, and this is what you're about. <laughs> this is what your association is about. Uh, the dependence that we have on each other. And the first step, as you ask, is to recognize this. Then we can change our behaviors and start acting. And, and frankly, marches and so on. Uh, you know, a million people, mostly women, marching when Trump got elected. Uh, he just kind of looked at this and laughed. These weren't the people who elected him. He didn't care. And, and then they occupied, or before that, they occupied Wall Street. People occupied Wall Street. Well, Wall Street is not a problem. Wall Street is made out of concrete and asphalt. Uh, Wall Street is not the problem. It's behaviors behind the closed doors of Wall Street that matter. So if we want to change things, we're going to have to target those behaviors. Uh, a, a silly example, not silly, but a trivial example in a way, from Uruguay, a very rather corrupt country, uh, a senator was tried and acquitted for corruption, and women got so mad, some women got so mad, they started pelting his house with eggs. And eventually, the smell got to him, and he resigned, uh, interestingly enough. So that's the kind of thing we have to do, more serious stuff. We have to do real things, not march. I mean, marching is fine. 
but insufficient and we have to uh, um, you know attack and get creative about it i mean we, we can we really need to get creative about how we challenge obscene or unacceptable behaviors uh, we can be quite creative yeah, and this idea of interdependence is, is, is really interesting. I was working in Poland with uh, NGOs who were supporting Ukrainian refugees and i like, hugely impressed. Like, these these uh, NGOs were sprouting up from uh, um, different organisations and, and in response to this, this sudden war. And visiting them kind of a year, 18 months later, every one of them was uh, not only focused on um, just delivering sort of crisis aid, they were thinking about how to build civil society in the way you're talking about. They were talking to uh, public sector organisations to sort of try and change civil society, to private sector organisations to get funding. And there was this really interesting uh, interdependence happening. And I think that's a really good example of, of what you're, you're describing there. Yeah, you know, consolidation is a big issue. Um, um, uh... There are all kinds of humanitarian movements and there are all kinds of humanitarian concerns. <clears throat> and all of us, Donald Trump perhaps accepted, but except, uh, ex excluded, um, but most of us have a humanitarian streak alongside everything else. But it doesn't come out in a, in a society of so much pressure. You know, <clears throat> I maintain that the rebalancing society uh, movement or effort um, will have to focus on people without mortgages. Uh, in other words, under 30 or over 70. You know, I, that's where I get the interest. That's where I get the most interest. Between 30 and 70, which is really a lot of your audience, I assume, so I'm not really fully serious, but between 30 and 70, people are worried about their mortgages. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their health care. Uh, and it's kind of like, that's a good idea. Somebody should do something about it. Well, the somebody who has to do something about it is you, Simon, and me, and everyone in the audience, and everyone who cares. So if uh, humanitarianism starts with a concern for what's out of whack in society, people who can't afford... You know, people with decent jobs who can't afford to feed their children or pay the mortgages now. Uh, Got to stop. And, and it's it's got to be a consolidated movement. We're too spread out. When business wants something like lower taxes, they know how to get together and do it. Mm -hmm. The plural sector, I, you know, does not. I, I was at Davos, the World Economic Forum, for the private sector a few times, and they have their act together. Then I went to the World Social Forum, which took place in Montreal, some years ago, and they do not have their act together. It's just a lot of people going in different directions. So my hope is that rebalancing society can provide, or the Declaration of Interdependence, can provide a kind of uh, uh, focal point. Yeah, that's very helpful. We, we've had discussions all day here. It's been really rich discussions, and um, we were talking about how, how the, our sector can be quite tribal and, 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 and doesn't kind of always work, work together. We've also been talking about leadership and there's been a lot of talk about collaborative leadership, partnerships. You talk about something called community ship. Can you say something about that? We have to get past leadership. I, I, I don't mean we can do without leadership. Of course, we need decent people. But, you know, uh, how many people can you or anyone else name right now who are really, truly decent, wonderful leaders. How, how many Nelson Mandela? There are Nelson Mandela people around the world. Why aren't they in leadership position? Why do we have imbeciles like Trump and Putin and Shao and Shai and, 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 I mean, what's going on? Why, where is decency? So, so the, the problem with the word, you know, the, the idea of leadership is some great, uh, one is going to ride in on a white horse and save us all. And maybe I'm contradicting what I just said, but uh, I don't think Nelson Mandela saved them all. I think he represented what was going on in South Africa. He represented a community movement in South Africa. Uh, the trouble with leadership is that it focuses on an individual. When you say leadership or leader, we mean an individual. Um, and individuals matter, but we need far more than that. We need community. We need community ship 
instead of nor instead of or but beyond leadership mm -hmm. um and that means uh leadership has to serve community ship leadership is that's what mandela did he served the community movement that arose in uh there and you know my, my model of the kind of change kind of social change we need is the reformation of the 16th century um you know luther was an obscure monk who tacked on some a rant essentially 95 theses which was a rant uh about uh, the papacy um his students took it off the wall of the church off the door of the church and used the social media of the time the new social medium of the time to go viral i mean literally literally namely the printing press and hundreds of thousands of this thing were circulating within weeks. It's uh, mind blowing. Um, so, so it was a community movement. Mm -hmm. Luther uh, represented it, uh, kind of stood for it, um, but it was a community movement, and that's the kind of change we need now in the world. Yeah, it's very helpful. I, I worked with you a bit on your IMPM, your International Master's Programme of, of Management, and there you, you bring people from the Red Cross humanitarian sector to work with people from banks and people from the public sector. Can you say something about your experience of this cross fertilization of, of learning? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of designed as a business programme, but, but it in fact has always uh, drawn in, thanks to a, uh, an adaptable fee structure, uh, it has brought in people from NGOs and so on, and and the, the managers probably learn more from the NGO people than the NGO people learn from the managers. It's always the other way, right? Everybody should be like business. Well, you know, government has to be run like a business. Well, show me a head of government who runs government, big government. I don't mean municipal government, but national governments decently uh, like a business. It's a lot of silliness. Um, they're, they're different, and 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 they can learn from each other. the The sister program is called the IMHL, IMHL.org, International Masters for Health Leadership. We got talked into you putting the word leadership in there, but anyway. Um, and it's uh, it, it it's really the plural sector program, but for healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have, we've had people from business, from pharmaceutical companies or for-profit hospitals, but for the most part, they're hospitals as trusts, they're state uh, public policy people, uh, all kinds of people. And, and they, this is a meeting ground where they can discuss with each other and, uh, and learn from each other because we need all three sectors in balance. Yeah. I'm wondering if anyone in the audience has any any questions or any, anything they'd like to ask Henry while, while he's with us. How do you bring such cultures around to that thinking, if you're looking at um, the USA in particular and its focus on independent, independence and freedom, how do you change it to looking at inter interdependence as a key um, plank of society? Um, I missed the whole first part because there was no mic, so maybe you could repeat. Shall I do it? The, the summary, at least. The, the question, Henry, is um, how do you shift from the, uh, the USA uh, Declaration of Independence to the Declaration of Interdependence? How, how do we make that shift? <laughs> well, you know, the Declaration of Independence was fine in its time. The Americans, uh, the Americans made a huge mistake, thanks to you Brits. Uh, uh, they wanted to stop any kind of semblance of a king uh, taking over their country. Um, and so they weakened government. Uh, and they introduced uh, checks and balances and all kinds of things to weaken government. And you're seeing it today with a vengeance. Uh, um, you know, uh, the executive branch is totally weakened now by the... Uh, 
by the legislative branch, um, which is totally dominated by public, uh, by private money. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, legalized bribery in 2010 in a decision called Citizens United, where they threw the floodgates open to the private funding uh, of public elections. Um, and they legalized bribery, and bribery dominates the United States today. And it goes straight back to the Declaration of Independence, which was obsessed with weakening the power of government, and they succeeded. It took it took uh, two hundred years or so, um, but they succeeded and and lost. And ironically, De Tocqueville was writing about the, the importance of the plural sector in eighteen in the eighteen twenties and eighteen thirties about the plural sector. Um, so it was very strong, and it's no longer nearly as strong, although it's huge, but politically not strong. Government is extremely weak in the United States. So if you look at the countries, I guess the answer in part is if you look at the countries that are working well today, most notably the Scandinavian countries, uh, most of them, um, uh, they have a kind of balance. In Denmark, you have a balance between civil society or plural sector business and government. Denmark doesn't lack for strong government. You know, uh, I think it was a Finnish woman who wrote a book. She she was an entrepreneur in Finland, I think it's Finnish, and then she went to America as an entrepreneur, and she concluded that it was easier to be an entrepreneur in Finland than in America. Because in America, if you go bankrupt, you got nothing. Your kids won't go to college, you won't be able to pay for health care, and so on. In Finland, or any of the Scandinavian countries, or Canada, or the UK to some extent. Um, if you go bankrupt as an entrepreneur, your kids continue in school. Uh, they can, in some countries, they can continue in university. Uh, and, uh, and you don't uh, live in mortal fear of losing your health care. Um, so, so that's the difference between independence and interdependence. Uh, another way of putting it is individualism is running rampant. Uh, everywhere, everywhere, but especially in the United States. I mean, the great hero in the United States is a vile human being named Donald Trump, um, who has, you know, I once made a list of all the awful things that people can be in uh, an independent list, and he's every single one of them. It's hard to imagine anybody being that humanly bad. It really is hard to believe. Um, so... And it's largely around a kind of individualism, me, myself, and I, and I don't give a damn for anybody else. You know, it's like people driving down the highway when you're passing at, at the speed limit, and they want to pass you because you're not passing fast enough. So they come right on your tail and, uh, and, and, and want to force you off their road, get off my road. But you're passing. You're not hogging the lane. You're passing too. So, so... Uh, there's a kind of crazy kind of individualism everywhere now, and uh, it's killing us. It is. Has anybody else got any uh, any questions for Henry while he's here? Any final questions? One thing I've been thinking about, Henry, is is uh, compassion, caring. These words, how do they fit into your, your thoughts around uh, a rebalanced society? Because clearly, in some societies, this has got very out of balance. It's become very narcissistic and, and selfish and individualistic. Are these part of your thinking that, that we have to shift it towards a more compassionate, caring way of being? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you care about your progeny, if you care about your planet, if you care about your food and you care about your physical environment, how could you not want to rebalance society? It's quite clear that the problems we face today, uh, whether they're income disparities or climate change or superpower, the corruption of superpowers or whatever it is, they're all caused by imbalance. 
A lot of them are caused by the power of the private sector in the so-called liberal democracies, which are ceasing to be liberal or democratic. Uh, a lot of it is caused by that, but it's also caused by um, uh, other uh, other uh, imbalance. Uh, you know, the, the people who are fed up with uh, with the uh, imbalance in favor of business vote populist. And they're, they're doing it in almost every country. Yeah. Um, Italy now and uh, Iran. And, no, they don't vote in Iran much, but uh, Turkey, uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, Hungary, Venezuela, you, you know, and, uh, and uh, that's how they're lashing out. But, you know, that's not going to solve their problem. I, I think Trump has two kinds of uh, supporters, and they're very different. Um, uh, uh, one are the just plain angry people. Maybe they're angry because they hate their parents. Who knows what, why, but they're angry. Um, the others are those who feel belabored. Uh, belabored by mortgage rates and inflation and insecurity in the job market and insufficient health care coverage uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and those people uh, uh, can be swayed back to a center uh, in some ways uh, or balance. Uh, this, the center is not necessarily balanced. The center is compromised. Balance is something else. Mm. But, you know, I, I just published, I have a blog called mintzberg.org slash blog. And the current one is is why this liberal Canadian uh, believes that Nikki Haley should be president. Um, and my argument is that Biden, much as he's done very well, I think, uh, will not reconcile or bring back into the fold those people who feel screwed by the system, screwed by the powers, screwed by the high uh, salaries of some members, some parts of the population and not others, uh, screwed by the executive compensation and big companies. Um, and and they need to, uh, to uh, you know, they're, um, they, they feel the situation is uh, sure. not favor and uh, Henry um, we've come to the end of the session I want to say a very warm thank you we're really grateful for your wisdom it's been lovely to hear your voice and uh, hear hear what you've got to say so thank you very much indeed it's been a real pleasure it's yeah. always been a delight to work with you.